Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Bacola Ogunmola. I work here at the, your college at the Men and Women's Center as the Special Events and Marketing Coordinator. Um, yes, so good evening. Um, <laughs> so um, we are going to start with the informative speeches, as he said, and then we're going to go to the persuasive speeches. And the order is picked randomly, so please be prepared. Um, and I apologize for mispronouncing any of the competitors' names. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> and from the judges and all the faculty and staff here at York, we would like to wish all of you good luck. And we're going to start. OK, and we're going to show, show you the sign. Yes. Uh, these are the signs he's going to be holding up. Um, yes. In the back. So the first sign means? One minute has passed. Two minutes have passed, and so on and so on. You get the idea. Yes. At the end, you get a wrap up. After seven minutes, you get a wrap up. That doesn't mean stop dead in your tracks. That means move gracefully towards your conclusion. If you missed the wrap up, I'll be doing this as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dr. Gordon L. Young, by the way, the president of class. Thank you. All for Thank you guys so much for coming. I know how difficult it is to stand up here. And we're going to start with Tenzington, Tenzing, Tenzing Sharpa. Yes. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tenzing Sharpa. I am from John Jay College. And before I start, uh, I want to start off with a quick poll. Now, who might think that I'm good at math? <laughs> please, be, please be honest. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, that's that's hilarious because I'm actually terrible at math. It's it's my worst subject. It's always been my worst subject. But I'm gonna let you know why you thought so. It's because of something called the model minority myth. Now, last year I went to a convention held by the Community Service Learning Program in Chinatown, and my favorite part of this event was a speech given on the effects of the model minority myth. And it was given by an NYU graduate who had majored in Asian American studies. And I was so intrigued that I decided to join her in her research and help spread awareness on this, on this phenomenon. So I've, to this day, I've given multiple speeches spreading awareness and, and educating those who are interested in this phenomenon. So today I'm gonna, oh, I'm sorry, today, So to do so, I'm going to first provide the definition and origins of the myth, followed by a few factors that help the myth continue to exist in our society. And lastly, I'm going to show an example of the myth in play. So what is this myth? The model minority myth refers to a certain ethnic, racial, or cultural group whose members are believed to achieve a higher average rate of success than the rest of the population. And in America, Asians are labeled as the model minority. Well, why is this so? Well, we all know that all stereotypes derive from some truth, right? Well, where did this stereotype come from? You see, the stereotype of the model minority myth comes from the success of the Asian Americans who have multiple generations of ancestors who have lived in America for some time. You see, these citizens are generally wealthier or just more financially stable as contrast to first or second generation Asian Americans who actually commonly live in poverty. So this myth has created a generalization of Asian Americans saying that every Asian American naturally does well in school and naturally goes off to go get good jobs. See, a prime example would be Family Guy because we see that this myth is so common to us, it's almost not even spoken of, but we see it all the time because it's portrayed in our media and entertainment. One example, Family Guy, which is a really famous show, I don't know if uh, most of you are familiar with the show, but it's really famous among young adults and teenagers. And there's a famous scene in Family Guy, which I love. And uh, Peter Griffin, who is the, the main character of the show, he's taking a test in college. And um, as all the other students are getting ready, you know, they're preparing themselves, taking out their calculators, Peter brings out an Asian kid from his backpack and tells him to do his math. It was, it was ridiculous. 
But I know what you're thinking. It, it, you know, it's only a cartoon show, and it, it's a silly, it's a silly example. It's a silly, it's a silly, uh, silly joke. But if you want a more real, exi realistic example, a more serious example, let's turn to the Time magazine from August 1987. Those Asian American biscuits. <laughs> You see, now let's pay close attention to this title. Those Asian American whiskeys, it, it almost suggests that we all, any reader, we all would understand the reference that's being made here, right? Because the word those is signaling that everybody already knows that Asian American students do well in school, right? So let's make an article about it. Well, the reason why everyone believes this is because certain Asian groups that do well in school, that fit the stereotype, tend to overshadow those that don't. You see, in fact, Margaret Sims, who is the director of human services from the Urban Institute of Research and Record, did a, re did a study on low-income families in 2010. And what she found was that 75% of all Asian Indians have at least a bachelor's degree, which is amazing, right? That's really impressive. But on the other hand, 20% of all Vietnamese Americans haven't even reached the high school level. And 12% of their total population live below the poverty line. So by the numbers, we see that this study done by Marcus Sims is a prime example of the model minority myth in play. So let's recap and look at what Look at what I've taught you today. We went over the definition and origins of the myth. We saw a few examples of the myth in play. And we saw a few factors that continue the existence of the model minority myth in our society today. So ladies and gentlemen, we can all say that we know what the model minority myth is and that it exists in our society. Thank you so much. That was very informative. Um, we're going to give our judges a couple more minutes. Yes? No? Yes? Okay. Okay. So um, we're going to call up Cesar Maria. Sorry, Marcia? Marcera. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Cesar, and I'm representing Bronx Community College. According to the Center for Disease Control, or CDC, at the end of 2009, an estimated 1.1 million people have been infected with the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, as it is more commonly referred to as. HIV is a virus that, if not treated properly, can develop into acquired immune deficiency syndrome, or AIDS. HIV and AIDS attacks a person's immune system, whose main purpose is preventing small illnesses from turning into major illnesses. HIV is a growing problem and poses a threat to everyone, gay or straight. <clears throat> Although we are past what was known as the epidemic stage, we are far from being free from, or even relatively close to being free from the effects of HIV on society. Today, we're going to learn about HIV through three points of analysis. First, where it started and whom it affects, then, uh, symptoms displayed by people suffering from HIV, and finally, how those living with HIV keep it at bay and how we can prevent ourselves from falling victim to this disease. According to actupnewyork.org, the first case of HIV was reported in New York City in, in 1980, and in that decade spread rampantly. During that time, most people succumbed to the disease because scientists had not yet developed a method of treatment. HIV does not discriminate. According to, I'm oh sorry, according to the previously cited CDC website in 2010, there were over 200 cases of children under the age of 13 diagnosed with HIV. Over 7,500 aged 20 to 24, and over 6,800 people aged 25 to 29. In total, there were roughly 33,000 cases reported that year. Of those cases, 51% were the result of male and male intercourse. Almost 10,000 were the result of heterosexual intercourse. In that same year, 40% of all diagnosed cases were women. <clears throat> now that we've 
looked at the numbers, let's talk about transmission. HIV is a sexually transmitted disease. However, there are other ways of obtaining it. The sharing of needles or even swapping blood with someone who is already infected are two other ways someone can contract HIV. There are several symptoms that are indicative of someone who suffers from HIV. According to WebMD.com, some of these symptoms are rapid weight loss, frequent tiredness, and frequent sickness. Though someone has these symptoms, it does not automatically mean that they suffer from HIV. The only way to know for sure is to get tested. Two commonly used testing methods are Oroquic and blood testing. The first, Oroquic, is an oral swab. Saliva is taken from the cheek or the gums of the individual and it produces a 99.98% accuracy. It is available in an over-the-counter form and is FDA approved. The second blood testing in its rapid form takes about 30 minutes and also produces nearly a 100% accuracy. The disease can lay dormant for, 10, for up to 10 years, so doctors recommend that people get tested every six months. Okay, now that we have looked at what HIV is and whom it affects, and looked at pos um, symptoms of HIV, let's talk about how those living with HIV keep it at bay and how we can prevent ourselves from getting the disease. Years ago, HIV was essentially a death sentence. In the documentary, Surviving a Plague, by ACT UP founder Peter Staley, 2012, when the epidemic first originated, hospitals were refusing to, to give care to people who suffer from HIV, saying that it was their own fault they contracted the disease. Today, however, there are many vitamins, um, many medications that people take that help extend their lives, and in some cases, even render the virus strand undetectable. More recently, in a groundbreaking medical milestone in Germany, a, an HIV positive patient was treated for a bone marrow transplant, and after receiving the transplant, doctors found that he no longer had HIV. Sorry. According to the article, HIV, Why Healthy Eating Matters, published on WebMD.com July 2012, a healthy diet and regular exercise can help the body combat HIV. Uh, for those who do not have the disease, the disease, protecting yourself is the best method for prevention. According to NYC.gov, one in five people living with HIV don't even know that they have it. Today we have learned about HIV. Uh, we've learned where, where it originated or where it was thought to originate, um, symptoms people suffer from, and also how people living with it maintain their health. Uh, I'm oh, sorry. The fact is that everyone and anyone can be at risk for contracting HIV, not just gay men. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, next, we will be calling Portia Cook. Good evening, everyone. How are you guys? All right, good. So, uh, my name is Portia Cook, and I will be discussing the physiological and psychological deficits of inmates exposed to supermax incarceration. So, just, just, just for a second, imagine this. We're all in a room full of people. Now, subtract every single living person from this room. Now, secondly, subtract the space in this room to about 8 by 10 by 12. So, just for this frame of mind for this speech, just get comfortable in that paradigm. So, imagine that I don't take away from you your fine linens or your luxuries or your fine wines, but I'm taking from you the very essence that, that constitutes what is a human being, for us to connect and communicate with other people. This is, this is not some scientific experiment. This is not some laboratory. This is really what goes on in supermax institutions across the nation. So, like I said, today I will inform you about supermax incarceration. And with that, I will first define what supermax incarceration is with a definition from the bureaus of prison. Secondly, I will discuss some bureaucratic problems, both in the institutions themselves and in the research. And lastly, I will discuss the physiological and psychological deficits. So first, as I said, 
Defined by the Bureau of Prisons, supermax incarceration is 23 to sometimes 24 hour lockdown in which there is little to, if any, contact with other human beings. Uh, there is not a lot of facilitative um, activities or anything available to you. And um, supermax was actually designed from the first prototype, which was Eastern, Eastern Penitentiary, which was in Philadelphia. They opened their doors in 1829. And it was funny because when these institutions started, it was more of a repentance to where they wanted to isolate prisoners so they can become one with themselves and get closer to God. But um, I don't think since 1829 to 2013, those ideals have really been held up. So this brings me to my next point, which are the bureaucratic problems that exist in Supermax. Uh, one problem that I noticed that the inmate selection and duration of such confinement is loosely determined. There's no federal regulation that states that if an inmate does this behavior, they have this much time. So it's kind of, you see in these institutions where there are certain personal grievances that are taken out against inmates. And even something small as throwing food to something as large as being a, what we call situationally assaultive are all reasons that people are landing up in uh, supermax confinement. Uh, something else that was noted in the research is that there aren't any longitudinal studies employed to see what the effects are once inmates leave Supermax and return back into society. I believe that this is a, a big fallacy because it's usually then that these behaviors arise when people are back in a normal, what we call normal context. Um, there are many officials who actually stand by the practice and say that it's okay. Um, but there are numerous psychiatrists who contest that any human being subjected to 23-hour lockdown leaves a lot and immense physical and physiological deficits. So if I could just narrow those deficits for you. Uh, physiologically, you have chronic anxiety, um, decreased frontal lobe activity, you have low arousal EEG patterns, and just from a physiological standpoint, prefrontal activity is what governs higher moral judgment and what overall makes us good rational human beings. So if you can physiologically attest that these people have a decreased prefrontal activity, you can literally say that this is sort of dehumanization in a sense. Um, psychologically, you have fear of social interactions, em emotional impulsivity, um, semi-fatuous states where people are just zombie-like, um, hallucinations, apathy, suicidal thoughts, tendencies or even self-mutilations. Uh, I, I, I deem this to be the biggest problem and it's overlooked in Supermax literature because everything has to be empirical and everything has to be APA style. But the sources that I see, whether they be blogs or just magazine articles where prisoners actually testimony, that's where the data is and that's what, where it's lacking. Research needs to just become a little more layman and and actually incorporate prisoner testimony into the research. The, the inmates that I've researched on, the inmates that I know in my community, they're desperate for treatment. And in the DSM, there's not one subsect of post-traumatic stress syndrome that just is specifically designated for prisoners. So I just wanted to bring some attention to supermax incarceration. And I just wanted to quote one quote from Emmanuel Kant. He says that, from the crooked timber of humanity, nothing straight can be built. So I just wanted to bring you this information, and I hope that it changes some lives. Thank you um, next, we will have Regina Armad. There's no part of the gym experience that makes me feel sexy. Not the damp, musty locker rooms, not the baggy shirts and track pants I work out in, and certainly not the sweat dripping down my forehead as I stumble through cardio kickboxing or huff and puff on the stair climber. But perhaps I feel differently if I put on sky-high stilettos in a push-up bra, swing tape past the standard gym equipment, and dance in front of a mirror for an hour instead. That was an excerpt taken from the women's blog, Divine Carolyn, called Pole Dancing for Health, How It Benefits the Body and Mind. <laughs> I have been pole dancing for over a year now, and out of all the sports I've tried, such as martial arts, track and field, dance class, aerobics class, and even kickboxing, pole dancing is by far my absolute favorite. 
Today, I'm going to inform you about pole dancing and explain why it's not just an activity that should be relegated to a seedy exotic dance club, but should be considered as a legitimate sport. I know that many young adults and adults in this day and age are very concerned with their body image. Pole dancing provides you with just the kind of strength and conditioning found in other rigorous sports, but it's 10 times as fun. Today, I will explain how pole dancing helps you stay in shape, how it contains just as much rigor as any Olympic sport to date, and why, because of how much fun it is, you'll want to engage in the sport for a longer time. To begin with, a lot of people have this misconception about pole dancing and associate it with stripping. But the truth of the matter is, pole dancing is a challenging, intense workout. According to a Livestrong article entitled, Which Muscles Does Pole Dancing Target? by April Redzik, an AFAA certified fitness instructor, pole dancing targets three main muscle groups. Legs, abdominals, and arms. That includes over 10 different muscles being worked. The shoulders, the upper and lower back, core, abdominals, obliques, glutes, quads, calves, ankles, wrists, you name it, pole dancing targets it. Essentially, pole dancing is a total body workout. One of the greatest benefits of pole dancing is that it targets your abdominal muscles. We all know that the best part of any body are the abs. <laughs> According to Dr. Isa's 2009 Ultimate Anti-Aging Checklist, having a strong core is key to improving your health. With a strong core, you're able to have a better posture have good muscle tone, improve in any physical performance, and more importantly, a strong core eliminates lower back pain. Most of the moves in pole dancing require you to use your stomach muscles to lift your body and to do different tricks. Just to show a few, we have the air invert, the attitude to flying legs, the ripple or also known as a push-pull hold, the bud, the chopper, or the cross ankle release hold. According to Dr. Kelly Olson's weight loss resource article, Pole Dancing Fun or Fitness, she says you can burn as many as 250 calories in one session, which can be compared to any good gym session. The International Pole Sports Federation, IPSF, is vying to have pole dancing as an Olympic sport in 2016. According to the Huffington Post, the IPSF took action on July 19th and 20th last year when they took their case to London with the World Pole Sport Championship, where women and men competed for medals in both the singles and doubles category. Pole dancing can even be compared to the Olympic sport gymnastics because of the amount of flexibility, strength, and control that it requires. Similar to the beam or parallel bars, but more difficulty because the pole is metal and slick. Lastly, pole dancing is just a fun sport. I'd actually like to give you guys a first-hand look at the studio that I pole dance in. I must warn you all. Pole dancing is very addictive. The feeling of accomplishing a new move or noticing dramatic results after pole dancing for a while is so rewarding that it keeps you coming back for more. This is probably the cause of participants engaging in the sport for a longer period of time. It's also up to you as far as you want to use pole dancing for. It can be used just for fun, as a workout, or even take it to a professional level and compete. Pole dancing is one of those sports that's so much fun that you barely notice that it's a workout. In all, pole dancing is a new sport that is being discovered by the world. It involves physical strength, help gains confidence, and all the while is fun and upbeat. What gets better than that? Even if you're not convinced about starting to pole dance, I hope you have learned enough to take the negative connotation away from pole dancing and out of your head and maybe even go for a spin around the pole. After all, who knew that an ordinary girl like this would be climbing to new heights such as this? So next time you're looking for a way to drop some pounds, don't underestimate the power of the pole. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and now we will be rounding out our informative portion of the competition with Sabina Garkusha. 
According to Carrie Williams of the Daily News, on July 22nd, 2012, Lloyd Morgan, his life has changed forever. Lloyd Morgan and his mother went to a community basketball game in the Bronx on the 22nd of July in 2012. When the game finished, his mother and he heard shouting. Two men had started arguing. They pulled out guns. They shot at each other. And then one bullet landed in his head. killing him. Several other men were injured. The day that Lloyd Morgan and his mother were able to spend time with each other to do something recreational and fun was the day that he had to die. In one moment, his life was snuffed out of him. Now please close your eyes and empty your mind. Imagine you and your loved one at a game or went to a park. You both are spending time with each other and enjoying each other's company. Everyone around you is having a good time when suddenly you hear a commotion. Your mother, your sister, your daughter, your child is shot. Imagine the paralysis your body is in. The grief that you may feel. You deny that the person is dead even as you watch their blood leaving their body and soaking the ground. Wouldn't you wish that there was something you could do, that nothing like this can happen to anyone ever again. Since the shooting in Sandy Hooks Elementary School on December 22nd of 2012, many people have been talking about gun violence and gun control. But all this talk isn't helping anyone. What is helping people is Mayor Bloomberg's initiative, Stop and Frisk. First introduced by Mayor Giuliani in the 1980s when he was New York's district attorney. Stop and Frisk was the response to the city's crime rates in the 1980s where murder levels were highest in the city. Bloomberg has enforced stop and frisk when he came into his office in, July, in January of 2002. And the city's crime has dropped tremendously. Stop and frisk is a policy in how the New York Times describe as a strategy that the police officers use to reduce crime in an area by stopping and searching someone they consider suspicious. Mayor Bloomberg states that by making it too hot to carry, the NYPD is preventing guns from being on the streets. That is our real goal, to prevent violent befo violence before it happens, not responding to victims after the fact. According to Rebecca Harshberger and David Safema, of the New York Post, there have been 25,000 major crimes committed from January 1st to March 30th of 2012, a period where cops stopped 200,000 people and individuals and recovered 881 guns. Crime figures have shot up to 28,000, where stops have lessened and the number of stops conducted were around 100,000, 133,000 and number of guns seized fell to 730.
Some people say that stop and frisk is a form of racial, racial profiling. Others say that the NYPD is bigoted in their searches. What some people fail to remember is that the police are here to protect us. They are here to uphold the law and to stop guns from being on our streets. We have to be mindful when we are susceptible to harm. I live in Coney Island, a racially diverse neighborhood, a low income neighborhood, where guns are prevalent. I have been stopped twice on my way to the subway. I know of people that have been victims of gun violence. For those of you that say that stop and frisk is a form of racial profiling, look at me. I am a white woman, a college student. I've been stopped twice. Would you put your loved one in danger because you cannot stand a moment's search? Thank you. Thank you very much. And can we get another round of applause for all the, all the students who spoke? You guys all did a great job, and I can honestly say that I've learned a lot today. Um, we're going to start our pers persuasive portion of the competition. And um, just a note that Ms. Cassandra, please wave your hand in the back. She will be doing the timing now, so please look to her. Pretty face. Nice dress. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to call up Mr. Carlos Rodriguez. Hello, my name is Carlos Rodriguez, and I am representing Kingsborough Community College. Okay. Imagine you're dining at a restaurant when all of a sudden ninjas jump out of the ceiling screaming Japanese gibberish. Yes, it's a bit insane, but it's actually very normal at the Ninja New York restaurant in Manhattan. This place will have you entertained as you dine fine Japanese food. But before I get started, let me just say that I have done extensive online research on the restaurant, as well as I visited the restaurant uh, and spoke to the workers there. This is why I'm able to speak to you today. Here's what I'll be covering. First, I'll be speaking about the problems with many New York City restaurants. Then. I'll be speaking about why you must dine at Ninja New York. And lastly, uh, what experiences will you receive at Ninja New York? The problem with many New York City restaurants is that they're losing customers very quickly. In a, um, in a survey by Zegat, a company that serves New York City restaurants, they say that many restaurants are, have a decrease in customers due to the lack of entertainment. You see, these days, we're so used to being entertained in our everyday lives that it has become almost an expectation. So why would we go to a restaurant with plain decorations, boring wares, <laughs> and decent food? <laughs> this is New York City, people. Another problem with many New York City restaurants is the amount of space you have uh, in between tables. In another survey, also by Zagat, they say the top 10 most annoying restaurant trends, and one of them being tables ridiculously close together. Seriously, unless you had a waist the size of a pencil, squeezing out of your seat without bumping your neighboring customer, it's highly impossible. But don't worry, my friends. Ninja New York is here to save the day. Ninja New York is not your typical restaurant. That's why you must go dine there. I mean, the whole place is like a huge stage, and you're a part of it. In an interview with Haru Ijazaki, the president of the uh, restaurant, he says that the restaurant is, uh, make, the makeup of the restaurant is based on an ancient ninja Bible. Now, I have no idea what this ancient ninja Bible is, but to me that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, they have 
uh, rocky walls, secret passages, and even the restaurant itself looks like a regular looking building in Manhattan. So probably you passed it a couple of times by Chamber Street, I didn't even know there was a restaurant there. Uh, another problem with uh, many New York City restaurants, I mean, sorry about that. Um, but well, anyways, like I was saying, the, you know, the rocket passages and, uh, and uh, the whole makeup of the whole place is, you know, very interesting. Another good thing about it is that, another interesting thing is, like I said before, the restaurant, you know, it's like a regular looking building and um, so here are some other pictures of how the restaurant looks. So another uh, interesting, I mean another good, I'm sorry, another nice feature about the restaurant is that there are, each table has, there is the amount of space you have between tables, right? Literally each table is in a small dungeon that has about seven, it fits about seven people in there. And they have this huge lounge section where you can have, you know, for bigger parties. Now, that's pretty cool. Um, but if that still hasn't convinced you guys to go die in Ninja New York, then I got something you guys can't resist. And that's food. In an interview with uh, um, Mishinobu Okamoto, the restaurant's chef, he says that they make high quality uh, food dishes. For example, the, food, the dish called the bonsai dish. It uses pie crust and other ingredients to make the ship into a tree and a hint of green tea leaves to make it look more, more realistic, as you can see on the slide. Another uh, well-presented dish is a Caesar salad dish. It has a, uh, a grapefruit and a, cra and a crab shell, and in between it has a small sword that when taken out uh, a, va a va cold vapor comes out of the bottom, giving it such an artistic and very beautiful feature in, to, to just the Caesar salad. But the best part of the restaurant is not all this. It's actually that it's not too expensive at all. A three-course meal is only $38. Now, I'm not talking about a small little plate that you get at restaurants <laughs> with even smaller portions of food. No, no, no. I'm talking about humongous plates fit for a king. For more, uh, for more on the menu, you can visit the Ninja New York restaurant. Now, as you guys all see all of this and wonder, you know, how, you know, I'm gonna get them, things like that, you know, this place, you guys, I urge you, everyone, I urge everyone to go to this place. I mean, it's full of entertainment, high quality food, and it has a breathtaking scenery. This place will keep Keep you coming back over and over again. And so, today I've talked about problems with many New York City restaurants and why you have to must dine at this place. And lastly, what uh, food experiences will you have there? But remember something. Everyone, we all need to be entertained. What a better way to be entertained than a, a ninja themed restaurant, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> um, yes, that sounds very interesting. I see you want to go there, yes. <laughs> um, next, we're going to call up Angela Sigram. Sigram? Sigram. Angela Sigram. My name is Angela Sigram, and I'm representing your college. In February 1994, 15-year-old Sarah visited a woman's clinic in Houston, Texas, where she was told that she was eight weeks pregnant. Unbeknownst to her parents, Sarah had an abortion, commonly known well, also a DNC. She was sent home with a prescription for antibiotics and the following was scheduled for a follow-up appointment in two days. Sarah did not take the antibiotics nor did she go to her follow-up appointment. A few days later, Sarah had heavy vaginal bleeding, fever, chills, severe abdominal pain, and nausea. Three weeks later, 
Sarah's parents buried her at 15 years of age. Sarah died of sepsis. As a mother, I would like to be notified if my daughter had an abortion. Ladies and gentlemen, there needs to be parental notification for underage abortion in every state. In order for you to affirm my position, I'll give you a background on parental notification. According to U.S. Supreme Court rulings, the first major case involving parental involvement legislation was decided in, in 1976 in Planned Parenthood of Central Missouri versus Danforth. This case involved a Missouri law that required consent from various parties before an abortion could be performed. Written consent by the patient, spousal consent for married individuals, and parental consent for minors specifically. The court ruled that the parental consent provision was unconstitutional due to universal enforcement. However, the, the ability of a minor to acquire an abortion against her parents' wishes soon became a recurring theme in several most, more cases following the Planned Parenthood of Central Missouri versus Danforth case. As of June 2012, statefacts.org stated that there are still 15 states where no parental involvement laws are enacted, New York included. I will define the terms parental notification, post-surgery complications, and state intrusions in my three contentions, which are the risk and lack of post-abortion follow-ups, why parents should be informed, and how the law is intrusive and biased when it comes to parental involvement in their children's lives. I will begin by telling you about the risk associated with teenage abortion. According to the Encyclopedia of Bioethics, abortion is a serious surgical procedure that has significant post-surgery complications. Post-surgery complications involve sepsis, pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID, hemorrhaging, uterine perforation, and anesthesia-related complications. Moreover, according to Elliott's review, the, according to Elliott's Institute, the post-abortion review, the average woman has a rate, has a 10% rate, rate of infection, which triples because of failure to follow up and comply with post-surgery care. More importantly, teens are less likely to follow up, less likely to follow post-surgery care because they're afraid their parents will find out, which put them at a higher risk for these post-surgery infections. In turn, these infections have serious consequences as we have seen, sadly, in Sarah's case. Secondly, I will tell you why parents should be informed. An article titled Parental Involvement Laws Protecting Minors and Parental Rights by, Miley, by attorney Miley R. Smith states, the purpose behind parental involvement laws is clear. Immature minors often lack the ability to make fully informed choices that take into account both immediate and long-range consequences. Yet the medical, emotion, emotional, and psychological consequences of abortion are often serious and can be lasting, particularly when the patient is immature. According to Elliott's Institute, the post-abortion review, about 40% of teen abortions take place with no parental involvement, leaving parents in the dark about subsequent emotional or physical problems. Teens further risk injury or death because they are unlikely to inform parents of any physical complications. Moreover, parents usually possess information essential to a physician exercise of his or her best medical judgment concerning the minor. Parents who are aware that their daughter has had an abortion may better ensure the best post-abortion medical attention. As such, parental consultation is usually desirable and is in the best interest of the minor, as well as foster, as 
For these reasons, parental involvement laws protect the health and the welfare of minors, as well as foster family unity and protect the constitution, constitutional rights of parents to rear their children. This brings me to my next point, which is the question of the state's intrusion upon the constitutional rights of parents to rear their children. State intrusion is when the state gets involved by superseding personal rights. According to an article by the American Civil Liberty Union of Florida, the Bill of Rights of the United States Constitution guarantees individuals the right to personal anatomy which means that a person's decision regarding his or her personal lives are none of the government's business. That right, which is a part of the right to privacy, encompasses decision about parenthood, which in this case is the parent's involvement in their children's life. Additionally, as early as 1923, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the Constitution protects personal decisions regarding marriage and family from governmental institution intrusion. So why is the government dictating how you raise your child? According to the Healthcare Policy and Politics A to Z, 2008, proponents of parental involvement laws point out that minors need a parent's permission to go on a field trip to get their ears pierced or to be given an aspirin by a school nurse. Yet, according to the US Supreme Court, parents do not necessarily need, much less be told, no, do not necessarily need to be told, much less to give permission for their daughters to have an abortion, which is a serious surgical procedure. And it has significant risk factors that can even cause that. So how biased? and contradictory is that. Ladies and gentlemen, Don Ravenel from New York died at age 13. Erica Richardson from Maryland died at age 16. Tamia Russell from Michigan died at age 15. And Sandra Kaiser from Missouri died at age 14. These teens died of post-surgery complications because Planned Parenthood thought that making a profit and advancing a political agenda was far more important than the welfare of the child and family. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next, we're going to have Manruz Zami. Yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Manruz Zaman, and I'm representing New York City College of Technology. Forty years ago, the graduation rate of the United States ranked number one in the world. And according to the New York State Board of Regents, guess where we are today? Not number one, not number two, not even third. We are ranked 19th in the world. According to an article published by the National Dropout Prevention Network called Economic Impacts of Dropouts, Nearly 1.2 million high school students drop out of high school every year. Almost 7,000 students drop out of high school every single day. And one student drops out every 26 seconds. And as of 2011, the New York City dropout rate was almost 40%. For that means for every five students, two students dropped out of high school. But why are so many students dropping out of high school? What is the cause? The National Dropout Prevention Center studied the reasons for students dropping out and more than 50% of the students admitted that they dropped out because they did not like school and school did not interest them anymore. Now whether you're a dropout or a graduate, the basic needs for everyone is clothing, shelter, and food. And stated in the article, The Value of a Diploma, an average annual income of a high school dropout is nearly $20,000, nearly $1,600 a month. And with this income, it is nearly impossible for a high school dropout to take care of a family basic needs. 
In 2011, NPR.org featured a story of a high school dropout named Kenny Buchanan, who is a Pennsylvania resident. He is now 44 years old. When he was 18 and in the ninth grade, he dropped out of high school. And he regrets it till this day. He said, those good paying jobs, I could have had. But since I did not have a high school diploma, they would not even consider me. Realizing his mistake, he eventually went on to get his GED. But not everyone is like Kenny Buchanan. Sometimes people get desperate, and desperate needs leads to desperate actions, crime. Due to the high rates of dropouts in New York City, the crime rate is also very high. Based on the, statistics, the crime statistics of New York City, just in the year of 2011 alone, there were more than 500 cases of murders, more than 1,400 cases of rapes, more than 19,000 cases of robberies, and more than 18,500 cases of assaults. But then the question arises, where is the link between high school dropouts and crime? How, those are two separate topics. Well, the study by the NDPC showed that a high school dropout is three and a half times more likely to be arrested than a high school graduate. More importantly, 75% of all crimes that are committed are committed by guess who? High school dropouts. And even to the extent where more, more than 80% of all prison inmates are, guess who? High school dropouts. Therefore, we must create after school career building programs in the public schools of New York City where students will be able to set goals in various professional fields in order to decrease the crime rate of New York City. By creating an environment where students will be exposed to various professional fields, they will realize which career holds their interest and eventually a future aspiration will be formed in them automatically. Now imagine your brother or your sister, your niece or your nephew, or even your child struggles with school, loses interest with school, and eventually drops out of school without realizing the consequences. Do they know that according to the value of a diploma article that states that a high school dropout makes $10,000 less than a high school graduate? Do they know that a high school graduate makes, a high school dropout makes $18,000 less than a person with an associate degree? And do they know that a high school dropout makes $40,000 less than a person with a bachelor's degree? These eye-opening facts will be given to the students in the career building programs. Now, if you look at an example that was set by the Options and Education High School in McAllen, Texas, where they adopted this, this type of after-school career building program, which is known as the Coca-Cola Valley Youth Program. And through this program, it was meant to prevent students from dropping out. In this program, parents and students were exposed to various professional fields and the benefit of each professional field. The program was eventually recognized by the Secretary of Education as a model dropout prevention program. And among the 1,066 students that joined the program, only 10 students dropped out. That is only 0.9% dropout rate. But wait, another question arises, who will pay for the after school programs? Who will pay for these programs? The country doesn't have money to waste right now. Well, a study by the economic impact of dropouts showed that if a program costs $10,000, then that program will eventually give the economy a $89,000 to $129,000 of benefit. That is an 890 to 1,290% in increase to your investment. Now, if I ask any one of you to lend me $1 on the condition that I will give you back $890 in interest, how many of you will give me that $1? <laughs> Therefore, we must take action now. We must take action now. Here in my hand is a petition requesting the Chancellor of Education to implement these type of programs in the curriculum of New York City's troubled high schools. All you have to do is sign, give your signature, give your name and your contact info, and then come with me. Come with me to the nearest Education Council's office, 
Over here, the nearest one is 15 minutes away. Come with me and together we can present this petition together. Come with me so we can stop crime. Come with me so we can change the prison suits with graduation gowns. Come with me so we can stop this epidemic of our students dropping out of high school. Come with me so we can get our nation's graduation rate back to number one in the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, next, we are going to have uh, Brian Miller. So I'm uh, Brian Miller, and I'm representing LaGuardia Community College. And uh, let's <laughs> zero zero alpha zero seven six nine Miller, call it. I like you to remember that number. We'll, we'll come back to it a bit later. But for now, just remember that number. My intent tonight is to speak on stop and frisk. My intent specifically is to call you all to action and to persuade you to take in knowledge and to take action against the law known as stop and frisk. I begin by speaking toward my own personal scenario, my own personal experience with stop and frisk. Now, on a night where my son was, was, was announcing me he needed some milk, so I decided I'd go I run to the store and grab him some milk. Fair enough. I put on my hoodie, throw on a scarf, ran downstairs. A night just like tonight. The store being about a block away, I run to the store. As I'm running, I see two gentlemen behind me. So I step over to let them go ahead. As I do, one gentleman grabs my arm, the other one grabs my waist. So of course, a fight ensues. Now I'm beaten, kicked, punched, dragged into the streets, and spat upon. While I'm arrested, while I'm handcuffed, the gentleman asked me, what are you fighting for? Which one to frisk you? Now, it was, they were identified later as being police. Now, this is my experience with stop and frisk. This is, this is important because we, have, we need this foundation to establish why it is that stop and frisk came into, came into action. Now, to be clear, the law on stop and frisk was work or enacted on the policy of reasonable suspicion, which means that the cops have to stop you, and they need, a, they need a reasonable suspicion in order to stop you. Now, in my case, the reasonable suspicion was that I was black and I was running. <laughs> but to be clear, according to, according to the New York State Attorney General, this is the ground of the basis. The United States Supreme, according to the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court has held that before a police officer may detain a civilian, the officer must be able to articulate a reasonable suspicion that criminal activity is afoot. Now, I'm not sure, but I don't think running to the store to give my son some milk is criminal activity. To be clear, he went on further to state that to stop someone, however, as, as that term is used in legal parlance and in, the, and in the report to mean detaining someone against his or her will, the police must first satisfy reasonable submission, reasonable, I'm sorry, reasonable threshold. Now, this being clear, there has to be reason to stop someone. In my case, with my experience, it wasn't so. Now, this law known as stop and frisk directly targets minorities. In fact, 93 out of every 100 stops were conducted in one neighborhood, Brownsville, New York. In that, nine out of every 10 stops that, that were performed were from this area on African Americans and Latinos. To be clear, there were more black men and Latino men that were stopped than there are black and Latinos in New York. In most of these stops, like my own, these situations end in violence, as mine did. And this is a reality that, that men who look like me, who are Latinos, face on a daily basis. Now, in addition, since 2003, there have been 5 million instances where there have been stops for people who look like me. And in those instances, they end normally in violence, as, as we stated. To be clear, since to, in 2011, a record 684,330 stops were conducted by New York City police officers. In just the first three months of 2012, 203,500 stops were made. Now, to be clear, this is 203,500 stops in the first part of the year, three months. In the entire year, 684,330 stops. Of that number, 0.15% were actually were actually uh, were actually found to have to have to have a weapon during the stop. Now this is 0.15% or 780 guns out of 684,330 individuals. This is 0.15% of those who were stopped. Now 
the, again, this is important, this is relevant, because the justification for this law is to reduce crime. In fact, 87% of all those who were stopped were black and Latinos, between the ages of 18 and 30 specifically. Now, of, those, of that 87%, 88% of those who were stopped did not receive a summons or were not arrested, which means they were innocent. This speaks to the law itself. This speaks to why the law cannot stand. This disproportionate effect affects a certain group of people who happen to look like me, who happen to be me. This reality is something that we must give attention to. In fact, I reiterate that 0.15% of those who were stopped were found to be guilty or found to have a weapon. If the, if the premise of this law is to, take, is to eliminate guns and eliminate, and eliminate violent crimes, this law is failing. Thus, like anything else, it must be repealed. Now, this study, this study was done by the New, York City, uh, the New York Civil Liberties Union. And what's more, what they identified in the study was that this was the racial component. right? So this racial stereotyping is something that comes into play. Now, to be clear, this system does affect blacks as much as it affects whites, as, we, as we've heard, and this is true. So while we're not saying that only blacks and only Latinos are stopped, we're saying that disproportionate numbers of those people are affected, and this is reality. But to draw the point home for those who, who don't look like me, I'll give you the story of Nathan. And Nathan, a young man, his mom would tell him before he'd go out with his friends who were black, she'd, she'd tell him, make sure you get stopped by the police, you don't talk back, keep your hands where they can see you, no, no sudden movements, be calm. He noted though, and she noted, that this activity generally occurred when he was with his black friends. When he was with his white friends, not so much. This was an issue when he was with those particular people. Now to be clear, to be fair, this is a true story, and these are middle class folks who face the same realities, but not on the same level. So again, we do, we do acknowledge it does happen to whites as well as blacks, but this law is targeted at a certain group of people. Now, look at this guy. Look, look at this guy. Remember that number in the beginning? That's him. His name is 00Alpha0769. He's an inmate. He was arrested in part due to stop and frisk. After his assault, this is him. This is my concern. This is why I'm worried. This could be you after an incident where stop and frisk takes place. You see, this issue does not only affect me, it affects every one of you. On different levels, this, this, this law can affect you, but the reality is the people that look like me, there's a greater proportion of propensity for violence. This is the face of stop and frisk. Why I do not suggest or why I do not inlay that you, you, you have to be pro-police to be against stop and frisk, I do contend that you should not have to choose between civil rights and freedoms, between justice. These things have to be manifest, and it's our responsibility to do just that. In closing, I ask you to act. Again, I, I, I conclude by saying that this is the face of stop and frisk. It may take different faces, but this is the face that I know. This is what I know is being stop and frisk. As we walk away, there are many things that can be done with the, the amount of talent in this room. There are many things that should be done. But all I ask you to do as you walk away today is to begin a dialogue. These are your students your brothers, your friends, your associates. Begin now, start that dialogue, and let's see if we can go from there. Thank you very much. Next, we will be calling up Chris Nickerson. Ladies and gentlemen, my fellow Americans, it is with great sadness that I stand before you tonight to inform you that our democracy is failing. No longer do we head to the voting booth to choose who we think is the right man for the job. We are merely forced to choose one of two guys who we think is less evil. <laughs> we have more options in one aisle in the grocery store than we do on our ballots. Imagine if you could only choose between Coke and Pepsi. No more Mountain Dew, Sprite. The Democratic and Republican parties now have a seemingly unbreakable monopoly on American politics. If we fail, 
to adopt a system of government where third party candidates are not just a meaningless option on a ballot, but viable contenders for public office, our democracy is doomed. Tonight, I will tell you what a third party is, how the Republicans and Democrats have a monopoly, and how we can implement a system where third party candidates could be viable. What is a third party? The Oxford Dictionary defines third party as a person or group besides the two primarily involved in a situation, especially in a dispute. In politics, third party does not just refer to one party, but to a multitude of political parties that are not Democrat or Republican. And their name, third party, by its definition, marginalizes them from participant in the race to spectator. Did you know that in the 2012 election, four other parties nominated candidates for president that were also on the ballot in enough states to win? They were the Justice Party, the Constitution Party, the Green Party, and the Libertarian Party. Who here knows who Gary Johnson is? How about Ralph Nader? Ross Perot. <laughs> All of these men ran for president as third party candidates and none of them were allowed to participate in the presidential debates. Nader and Perot are popular enough that you know who they are, but still were not allowed to debate the Republican and presidential candidates on TV. Why? Because they are viewed as a threat. In the LA Times on July 22, 2007, Todd Gitlin, who's a professor at Columbia, credits Ralph Nader only with siphoning votes from Democrats. And this is why most of you don't know who Gary Johnson is. So let me tell you exactly how they are discriminated against. In business, antitrust laws were put in place to protect the American people from companies becoming too large and having monopolies. They state, that if a company is deemed to be too big and have too much influence, then they will be broken up or regulated. Right now, Republicans and Democrats can rig the game so that they are the only ones who ever reach office. According to an article by Teresa Welch published in US News on October 3rd, 2012, in order for a candidate to be allowed to participate in the presidential debate, they must reach 15% on national polls. Who decided this? The Commission on Presidential Debates, which was created by Republicans and Democrats. Does this seem fair? It seems to me like antitrust laws are just as necessary in election politics as they are in business. Another way that Democrats and Republicans have complete control is their bank accounts. According to an article in the Washington Post on December Twix, that December 6th, 2012, the total amount spent by Republicans and Democrats on the 2012 election surpassed $2 billion. That's right, $2 billion. Third party candidates simply do not have the same funding available to them. In order to get matching federal funds to whatever they can raise on their own, a candidate must reach 5% of the vote in the same polls used to determine if they are allowed to participate in the debate. But without the national media exposure that debates provide, it is almost impossible to do even that. The argument against allowing third party candidates into the debate is simple. On May 5th, 2012 in the Seattle Times, executive director of the Commission on Presidential Debates, CPD, Janet Brown is quoted as saying, over 200 candidates run for president every four years. We can't let them all on stage. It is true. I don't know what just happened there. That hundreds of candidates run for president every four years. But only a few of them are on the ballot in enough states to win the election. Those are the ones we could allow in the debate. It is vital to abolish the 15% threshold. The former governor of New York, Mario Cuomo, is quoted as saying, 
Simple rule. If you're going to give them taxpayers' money on the theory that they're credible candidates, then you ought to let them participate. So, the first step should be to urge the CPD to change the percent of poll voters a candidate needs to participate in the debate from 15% to 5%, which is the same number that they need to get that matched federal funded. With more media exposure through the debate, the candidates will get more money. And we will make third-party candidates viable contenders for all level of public office and save our democracy. It is time to hear more voices. It is time to have more options. I urge all of you to contact the CPD and tell them to abolish the 15% threshold. Demand your choice. Demand your freedom. Sorry guys, this is our last meeting. We're going out of business. And you ask why? Well, the blacks are doing a better job getting rid of themselves than we ever did. Are we so far removed from the hatred displayed against the black Americans, from the anti-Semitic racists that we forgot the mayhem perpetuated that is now being done by way of black on black crime? Today, I'm here to motivate you to, get, to help stop black on black crime. I ask you to listen objectively as I speak about the problems, touch on some of the possible causes, and look forward towards a solution to stop black on black crime. First, let's establish the fact that there is a problem with black-on-black -black crime. According to TheBlaze.com, some critics state that the epidemic is not even a national calamity. However, the, according to the Bureau, of Statistics, um, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, in 1997 to 2011, there was two, over 2,700,000 2, black murder victims. And out of these murder victims, 94% of these murder victims were done by way of black-on-black -black crime. That leaves us with an astounding number of over 262,000 excuse me, black murder victims killed by way of their own kind. Now, this is the realities that we see in the epidemic of black-on-black -black crime. This has to stop. Who pays the price? Everyone suffers. The community at, at whole and at large. We have the, um, there's nothing pleasant about going to a funeral of your son or your daughter slain in the streets by way of black on black crime. The senior citizens, they're afraid to walk to the store. Let's talk about the children. The children, they lose their uninhibitedness to enjoy their neighborhood. This has got to stop. The mayhem is going far too, far too long. Now, now that we discuss the fact that there is a problem, let us look towards some possible solutions, some possible causes that may be a reason for this mayhem. According to Prosecutor Joseph Deaver of the Hamilton County, County, Hamilton County District Office and Reverend Damon Lynch, they both believe that because the lack of a male authoritative figure in the black family home is a reason and a cause for black on black crime. Joseph Dieter of, of Hamilton County, he stated that out of two thirds of the kids in juvenile prison were raised by their mothers or grandmothers alone. Reverend Damon Lynch, he states that the community, the family is suffering, therefore the community is suffering at large. And he insists that the destruction of the black family stem is the main cause, the root cause of having no male authority figure. This is why the mayhem is being displayed. Statistics show that in 1920, there was 90%, 90% of, of male figures, male authoritative figures in a black family. 19, 1960, there was 80%. In 2011, it's only 30%. Folks, 30%. That's three out of 10. This has got to stop. <coughs> this has got to stop. Okay, excuse me. So now we see that the cause, the cause can also be a fact that we can also um, 
put in some factors of the of the causes being lack of education, poverty, low mor low morals, lack of values, as well as ignorance. But I'm going to take it a step further and say we have lack of gun control. Lack of gun control is a major part of it because of the simple fact that we don't have gun control. Now we see now that we notice now that we've stepped on a problem of black of black on black crime. We also touched on some of the possible causes of black on black crime. Let's move forward towards solutions. Getting involved. Getting involved is a major major solution. Many problems, many people don't acknowledge, acknowledge problems until the problem become our own. Right? So what do we do? Preventive responsiveness. Preventive responsiveness to the fact that we know that there's an issue can and maybe will help stop the violence of black on black crime. So what we do, we educate our children. We tell our children that life matters. We teach them morals, we teach them values, we teach them how to live a life of a productive life. We teach our children also that family matters. We spoke about, I spoke about the fact that there's no male authoritative figures in the home. Teach our sons, let us teach our sons how to, be, how to take responsibility as a family for the male, uh, uh, male authoritative figure in the family. And let, us, let him teach him how to take care of his family. This young man, excuse me, was going to run out and get some milk for his son and unfortunately had a bad break. Sorry about that. However, he was taught morals and values. We need more men like him in the black community. Unfortunately, poverty has a lot to do with it. So how else can we get involved? We can also get involved by calling our local, get in touch with our local legislators. We can go to www.house.org forward slash representative, sign petitions to keep our streets safe. This is our safety. This is about us and our children. And we can also get in touch with the local law enforcement, form neighborhood watches, stand ground, stand guard. When I was growing up, we had neighborhood watches all throughout the neighborhood, in the, in the um, urban areas as well as in the suburban areas. Bring them back. We need them, especially now. Okay, we can also do what millions of moms did in March in New York as well as other cities, even on Capitol Hill, to stop senseless gun, to help sense, with senseless gun control. And we can do that by going to www.bradycampaign.com for gun control. Today we, we explored the problems, some possible causes and solutions to black on black crime. And now we can probably understand the perplexity that the KKK leader had on his face when he, when he called his, um, called his um, leaders to disband. However, we understand the true mind when they say, when he said, if a nigger kills a white man, it's murder. If a white man kills a nigger, it's justifiable homicide. But if a nigger kills another nigger, that's just one less nigger. And this is how it seems. Can we have another round of applause for all the participants? <laughs> Wonderful job, guys. This was an amazing event, and um, please, also participants, uh, thank your educators who are also here with you today. So can we get a round of applause for them? Also? <laughs> and now I'm going to turn it back over to Tim Corkery. Wonderful. All right. We're just we're going to give out the medals. We just have to, to tabulate the persuasive speeches. I'd like to thank you for participating today on behalf of the president of York College. We hope you come back and visit us. Oh, hi, Dean Melty. Surprising me again. So we'll, if you'd like to, uh, we'll convene in what, 10 minutes? 10 minutes, okay? Right here.